Okay, now to tell us more about Rex Education and to officially open today's event, let us hear from Rex Education's Chief External Affairs Officer, Ms. Danda Crimelda Aibuhain. Good afternoon, and thank you everyone for taking time out to be with us today. Before we move on to today's exciting discussion and lecture, allow me to introduce to you the brand new Rex Education, a brand, a community, an advocacy, and a tradition of service dedicated to inspiring every Filipino lifelong learner to advance themselves and uplift others. With 70 years of service, we have evolved from that iconic bookstore that we all know to something bigger and more significant. From just providing learners with published educational materials, we are now accompanying everyone throughout their lifelong journey, learning in all forms, beyond the walls of institutions, learning for delight, enlightenment, and fulfillment. And true to our tradition of service, Rex Education is guided by the Educampion philosophy, which seeks to rally and empower education duty bearers. We believe that all of us are Educampions, champions for education, and are all working with the best interests of the Filipino whole learner. Our mission is to empower all duty bearers in the field of education to champion education no matter what the circumstances are. It is through and because of this that we are excited to spend today with you for the Philippine legal community. A multidisciplinary approach in legal writing is the newest publication from Rex Education that aims to address the difficulties and deficiencies of students when it comes to legal writing. While most have a good grasp of Philippine laws and rules, poor writing skills can lead to unintelligible answers. The very important writing resource will help users to become smarter and more systematic when it comes to coherent legal writing. On top of this, what truly distinguishes this book from other instructional materials and legal writing is its utilization of Supreme Court cases and other legal documents as examples. In its last chapter, the book will also lay down the basic rules of legal research, making this book a must-have, not just for law students, but even for veteran lawyers to routinely engage in the preparation of pleadings and other legal documents, as well as members of the bench and court attorneys, who craft court issuances on a day-to-day -day basis. Today, we are most honored to have with us the three great minds who brought to life a multidisciplinary approach in legal writing. First up is Joanna Felisa Sigo. She's an English language lecturer and foreign language instructor at the De La Salle University. Next is Lex Michael Girita. Write foreign language teaching assistant at the University of Michigan, Caraga Region Campus. And finally, we have attorney Justin B.J. Sukang, the director and chief innovator at the Center for Legal Education Advancement at the BLSU College of Law. He's also an associate professor of law and academic support program coordinator and a former commissioner of the Legal Education Board. Friends, honored guests, join me in welcoming our partners in championing legal education, Joanna Felisago, Michael Giritan, and attorney Justin Sukang. Good afternoon and thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Good afternoon, so, attorney. Good afternoon. So, shall I start? Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Rex Education for publishing our book and organizing this book launch. I would also like to extend my deepest gratitude to Gertrude, my wife, for her understanding and support. 
I wrote significant portions of this book during the holiday break, and she was very patient with me. I can vividly remember writing uh, the legal research portion during New Year's Eve, despite the fireworks. I thank my ever-supportive parents, Juden Floor, my brother, Jerome, all my relatives and friends uh, in uh, from the Spinas, Cavite, Laguna, and my colleagues in the legal education community, and of course, from De La Salle University. Most of all, I thank my Lord and Savior, from whom, from whom all blessings flow. Before I start talking about the book, allow me to share the philosophy behind it. Legal writing, as well as legal technique and logic, legal research, and statutory construction are often neglected by many law students. Viewed as unnecessary, many would rather deep dive immediately into bar subjects than spend time and effort to master these non-bar subjects. Fortunately or unfortunately, laws change. In a stroke of a pen, our legal system allows Congress or the Supreme Court to change any law, or at least its interpretation. The same can be said with the executive branch. Our legal and political history can attest to this fact. Indeed, laws can be changed easily. And laws can also change gradually. But the skills to learn, understand, analyze, interpret, and construe laws do not. Strongly believing in this philosophy, legal writing, one of the most important legal skills, must be better and more systematically presented. One may know how to find the law. One may even know the law itself. And one may know how to correctly apply the law to a given set of facts. But if one cannot communicate it clearly, efficiently, and persuasively, orally or in writing, then everything is rendered negatory. We therefore endeavor to present this skill, this course, from a multidisciplinary perspective. The name speaks volumes about its essence. Legal merely qualifies writing. The core is still writing, English writing to be more precise, albeit applied to law. And this is the first time to our knowledge that presents legal writing, the course, capital L and W, and legal writing, the skill, in this manner. Compared to the dominant names writing about the subject, we, your authors, are young academics. Hopefully, despite our youth, and precisely because of it, we are able to bring a fresh perspective on teaching and learning the law. Together, let us reimagine legal writing as a course and legal writing the skill, not only from the purely legal perspective, but also through the lens of English studies and applied linguistics, of which this course is merely a subset. Now, let me proceed to the value added of the book. Through this, I hope you will be convinced in investing in what I personally call as the, the white book on legal writing. Yes, the book was designed primarily to assist law students. But since the problem plaguing legal writing is not exclusive to them, even young and battle-tested law practitioners will benefit from the white book as well. First benefit, the book aligns itself with the, aligns it, its content with the requirements of the Legal Education Board. Section 58 of the LEB Memorandum Order Number no. 1 Series of 2011 describes the course and enumerates the minimum topics it should discuss namely legal writing techniques, legal bibliography, case digesting, reporting analysis, legal reasoning, and preparation of legal opinions or memoranda. But more than this, the second advantage is that the white book is the only book in the market that successfully anticipated the changes brought about by the revised model curriculum under the recently issued LEBMO number 24 series of 2021. In fact, if you read the book from cover to cover, you can even say that it is actually legal writing and legal research all rolled into one. The only reason why we entitled it as such as legal writing alone is because we were not yet sure whether the RMC or the revised model curriculum will be issued at that time. But almost all changes in the RMC have been incorporated here. We are proud to say that the white book is the most holistic and comprehensive resource material in the market. So this is the third advantage. It includes additional topics and that are intimately related to legal writing. And what are those topics? Uh, for well, well, number one, issue spotting and analysis, 
common problems in English writing, effective response to written prompts, avoiding plagiarism, evaluating sources, citation systems, and application to your thesis writing. All of this are incorporated to ensure comprehensive presentation of the course. Notice these topics. They enable the reader to complete the writing process from conceptualization to structuring to actual writing and finally to citation. The white book also discusses the covered topics thoughtfully and methodically. This book approaches the foregoing topics systematically and seamlessly, taking in mind the usual background of and challenges encountered by first-year law students, as well as bar examinees and even freshly minted practitioners. The examples are carefully curated. What we used are not only the usual, general, regular, common grammar in English examples. On the contrary, Analysis and critique of Supreme Court cases and other legal documents are an essential aspect of every topic. The examples are highly contextualized. Sixth advantage, it incorporates practice exercises into all topics. The material intends to function not only as a textbook, but also as a workbook. We added practical exercises which you can use to immediately test your understanding of our discussion. And lastly, we approach legal writing from a multidisciplinary perspective, and the authors come from diverse backgrounds. We are all educators here and are actually fond of research work. Two of us are law instructors, two are licensed professional teachers, one has a psychological background and earned his Master of Laws from the United States, the other is a doctorate, uh, is, has a doctorate in applied linguistics and even became a Fulbright uh, foreign language teaching assistant in the United States. The other, bridging this disciplines, two disciplines, obtained her Master of Arts in teaching English language and a lifelong student of law. Hence, we present legal writing not only from a purely legal perspective, but also, also through the lens of English studies and applied linguistics of which this course is merely a subset. So to end my presentation, let me quote Ludwig Wittgenstein, the great philosopher of language. He said, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. Indeed, our prowess, our effectiveness, and our success in legal education and the profession are to a great extent a function of our proficiency in the English language applied to law. We hope that through this book, we can help address this perennial problem plaguing law students and bar examination takers and even lawyers. So allow me to share in my screen my presentation, at least a brief overview of the contents of the book. I hope you can see my screen. So the book has five parts. The first part, we reimagine the legal writing program. It lays down the foundation of everything, the philosophy, the framework of the, the, of the book. The second part is effectively responding to prompts. We believe that legal writing, to a great extent, is here because we wanted to answer legal questions. We wanted to articulate knowledge about the law. So we, if you look at part two, it talks about legal reasoning, actually. And then part three is the fundamental of English language, the book being multidisciplinary in nature. We wanted to look at the uh, functions of grammar, English studies, and of course, how, we, how the English language came to be. And then this fourth part talks about the fundamentals of legal writing. We now marry English, writing, and law. Talks, now the topics are the organization in legal writing, the principles, all the five C's in, in legal writing, legal stylistics, especially for bar examinees, uh, you can uh, take advantage of it. Uh, it shows how you style your answer, make your un answer not too boring or dull. We also present common mistakes in legal writing. We give practical exercises. And like lastly, we try to marry legal research and legal writing. So topics like avoiding plagiarism, we have an extensive discussion about plagiarism here, and then citation and referencing system, and lastly, writing your thesis statement or writing your thesis. 
So thank you. I turn over. I yield the virtual floor to our next author. Thank you so much. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. All right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank attorney Justin Sukdang, a fellow Fulbright Scholar at the University of Michigan, and Ms. Joanna Felisa Go of De La Salle University for this opportunity to be part in this advocacy for legal education reform and to Rex Publications for the chance to share our knowledge and be part of the workforce in bringing about quality education to the country. As what attorney Justin mentioned, we have conceptualized this book during the break. Also the time when my late father, retired city prosecutor, Felix Berto Giritan of Putuan City was fighting with cancer. I have really pushed myself hard in making this possible in dedication to my late father's passion in teaching and practicing law at Father Saturnino Norias University. I'd also like to thank my mother, Dr. Teresita Giritan, my siblings, Michelle and Oliver with his wife, Marvin and children, Oswald, Josh and Pearl Therese for their unending support, as well as my colleagues at the Philippine Science High School, Caraga Region Campus. Allow me to share and talk, uh, to share a presentation about how I have actually written and presented the fundamentals of the English language in this book. So I have just prepared like um, just a few slides just to give you um, a brief understanding on how the fundamentals of the English language is presented in the book. And we know that um, this is very basic. And, you know, if we compare these things in other books, it would likely be the same. But um, in our case, in my case, I have written it in a very simple way where even a high school student will really understand on how the language, the English language, is really constructed. So here in this book, I have written the fundamentals of the English language, as well as an introduction in writing theses, since I have been um, you know, um, exposed to research writing uh, since I am also a research teacher in our school and in our university. Now, the approach in writing and presenting the fundamentals of the English language started in the identification of the linguistic features in legal writing. As what attorney Sukkan mentioned, this is a multidisciplinary approach in legal writing. And so what I did as a linguistics major what we, what I did was to evaluate on how uh, legal writing is done. And with that, I have found out that um, most of the cases or most of the writing, legal writing samples that I have studied actually have hypotaxis or uses hypotaxis. This is a um, described as grammatical and rhetorical term used to describe an arrangement of phrases or clauses in a dependent of subordinate, sub, subordinate relationship. That is phrases or clauses ordered one under another. And this is actually the understanding that I am trying to, to project while writing the book. Here in this book, the combination or the process of combining words um, is presented wherein one word being combined with another word forms to phrases and then to clauses and then to sentences. But I think this is really important because the whole of the legal writing process or even English writing actually involves this one. And without this understanding, one person will not be able to write effectively. Having that concept from the word being added with another word, it goes with the same concept of adding clauses. So one clause 
to another clause. Right now, I know that uh, most of our viewers right now are actually law students or even law practitioners, and we know that clauses are very important in writing your your um, pleadings and whatnot, because um, these clauses actually contribute to the meaning of the sentence that you are constructing. And without a clear grasp or understanding of how to add these clauses and be uh, and constitute the meaning of your sentences, then it will really be a poor writing. Now, if to talk about the importance of really understanding this one also, this can actually be um, a strategy for the future lawyers and the current lawyers right now on how you're going to present your cases and how you are going to present your arguments in a way that this can actually be a tool for you to win your cases. So if, if you are a person who is not good in writing and you are not really able to express your arguments well, so I think that would be a bad practice for you. So I think this is really the very important thing for us to really understand so that, you know, we can have like, um, what do you call this? Like an edge over the others who are really not good in writing. Now, when I presented the fundamentals of the English language, since I am also an applied linguist, I actually made use of some court decisions wherein I have identified words I have identified phrases. We have evaluated those court decisions on how it were uh, on how it was written, and from that we had discussions um, integrating the English language in 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 writing. And the strategy here in writing this book is really for the understanding of those who have at least level one. So if you are really not, or if you're not knowledgeable, or you don't have a good um, foundation in the English language, the chapter that I have written will really give you that clear understanding of how it should be done. So that's it. I mean, I don't want to, you know, really talk about the contents of the book, but um, I assure you that the contents that I have written here is in the best way possible, written in the most, and sim the simplest way <laughs> for everyone to understand. And of course, my colleague, um, Joanna, Ms. Joanna Felisa Go, um, will also talk about the legal writing itself. So having known the fundamentals of the English language, we now go to applying it in the legal context wherein Ms. Joanna Go will be discussing. Thank you very much. Okay, I think um, you can hear the audio now. Yes, okay. So um, my portion in the legal writing book is a very, um, is a sort of a very uh, exciting one. Why? Because um, it's a bridge between linguistics and legal writing itself. So being a law student, and a senior, uh, an incoming law, uh, senior law student right now, I have dealt with a lot of um, issues and a lot of observations regarding the construction of many law students um, on how they um, construct their ideas and their sentences whenever they are making simple essays for submissions or simple um, or legal drafts or just simple narration of facts and even 
the very basic thing, uh, the very very basic task that we always do in law school, which is the case brief. Um, I've noticed a lot of um, pressure among law students who are not that fluent in the in the in the written skills. However, they there are um, a lot of um, ways in which they wanted to express themselves but they cannot so this increasing pressure there is an increasing pressure among law schools right now um, to really improve the instruction in practice oriented skills particularly in the basic foundation of legal writing the existing literature right now that we have on legal writing suggests many rules um and um i believe that um the the, the thing or the, the the topic on linguistics should not be shrugged off because it is important in order to uh, improve um a law student's writing skills um there are very um inadequate um avenues of um feedback coming from um some instructors also as i've noticed and these are the 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 issues that really prompted me to join attorney justin and dr lex in our quest to further improve and uh, to shed some um, light and some strategies on how to come up with a multidisciplinary framework. So this is our basic selling point, no? a multidisciplinary framework um, in teaching legal writing. And that is um, basically what our, uh, our big book is all about. It's a combination of our skills and our knowledge, um, a Dr. Lex's expertise in linguistics, my master's also, and my um, experience in linguistics as well as in law school, and of course, Attorney Justin's legal expertise. So um, besides that um, distinguishing point that our um, book has, um, there are also a lot of exercises and a lot of um, writing prompts that we uh, had already applied um, in our uh, in our classes in legal writing class at De La Salle University. And I can say and I can really prove that these are effective methods or effective strategies because um, students have um, they 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 have this um, they have this um, exercises to help them um, be more clear, more concise and more engaging, especially in writing their case briefs or their some of their the legal drafts or legal documents that um, um, some professors might um, make as an assignment. So um, here also, um, what makes legal writing very, very important in our belief, no? And I, I, I bet that many of our um, testimonials from our justices and our, from, from legal luminaries, um, from other legal luminaries will attest that um, the existing uh, literature on legal writing that we have right now, arguably, is um, related, it should have or should be delivered in a separate way of quality and aesthetic and elegance in nature. Um, and um, what I have prepared for right now is my part in the legal writing approach, particularly um, the second portion, which is the bridge. Um, let me share my screen. Um, it's just a walkthrough. I didn't want to fully um, explain everything because um, everything, because to encourage you also to buy the book. No? Um, first, um, my portion will be under the fundamentals of legal writing. So here, this is a bridge from linguistics to um, legal writing, wherein we talked about the importance of outlining. And there are a lot of exercises that I've prepared for um, here in um, fundamentals, particularly in the organization of uh, thoughts and of uh, statements towards elements of a good in, uh, organization. Um, how do we uh, arrange ideas in a logical order? And um, what are the identifiable uh, cue words to introduce or in an introduction, in a body and a conclusion? It is not really, what, what the approach that I did was not really in a college or undergraduate style, but more of a law style because um, I will have to give my students a, a lot of um, cases to, uh, to read and then they will um, put it in, in that format. Um, also, uh, in this portion of the fundamentals, 
um, there is um, uh, a practice or lots of practice regarding thesis statements. And uh, thesis statements um, and uh, central themes also. Um, a part of the fundamentals of legal writing will be uh, elements of persuasion because we know for a fact that persuasive uh, writing is uh, being argumentative is very important, an important skill in law school. No? Um, so basically, this portion of the book is the bridge between linguistics and legal writing. Now, when it comes to the principles of legal writing, like um, uh, the clarity, I, I just extracted the five Cs because I uh, really believe that with uh, clarity, conciseness, correctness, coherence, and cogency, uh, we know the concepts already of this. However, how did, how did we come up with an effective way of introducing it? It's more on the exercises, the writing prompts, and the situation, the cases, um, and which are scattered and um, derived from um, many, uh, many uh, portions of law, like political law, civil law, and we try to maintain it to be in the first year levels as much as possible, okay, so that they can also relate it with their um, with their learnings in um, in criminal law. In, uh, in persons, basically in the first year levels. Uh, and uh, the advantages of the exercises here is that it's all legal based, uh, which uh, are plenty. It's uh, abundant in style and elegant in style also. And of course, there are um, a, a guide. There's, there are guides wherein you can uh, really pinpoint how to do it correctly because the knowledge of the concepts is not enough okay it's really not enough what you have to uh, what what is really needed is to put this knowledge of the context into application and that's what i did in this portion for clarity conciseness correctness coherence and cogency and the subtopics for these principles will be um some of the <laughs> most asked questions like um is it, uh, is it teacher uh, better to use active voice rather than the passive voice? So we have a very thorough explanation about that in the book, okay? Um, and I am very proud of uh, that portion of the book because it, it shed light to many situations, no? And uh, in many instances where in some statements really or necessitates the need to do both. Uh, what else? So for the conciseness, correctness, these ha ha also has a walkthrough and a guide, okay? Um, so that um, the students can really apply what they have learned. Uh, the strategies under this, uh, we also um, use some acronyms so that it's the function of such, um, for example, an archaic word, but they still wanted to really defend uh, writing it or putting it in their documents, okay? Because, you know, archaic words, uh, they are strongly discouraged. However, we still see them, right? And it's a constant. Now, the, the, the thing here is that when do we, when is it appropriate to use these words, the appropriateness, the timing, okay, um, to use these words so that we can clearly deliver what we, and we can be very persuasive in our writing. Um, besides the acronyms as a strategy for, uh, in the middle portion, I also, um, discuss a lot of, um, errors, no? So, uh, the, the, what, the one of the, one of the thing that I've noticed is that, um, there are a lot of fossilized mistakes, fossilized mistakes in the field of linguistics. It's really these mistakes that we constantly do, or we constantly say, or we constantly write. Um, because we, it, it's, um, we, we, uh, we tend to avoid it, but we cannot. It's like, um, there is this, um, inclination in a person to really make some of these mistakes. Now, I had uh, a lot of discussion about that, about the errors. And, uh, the strategy I used here is the metacognitive approach. Um, so thinking about thinking, thinking and reflecting about your mistakes so that it will, you will not commit it again. And how, maybe if you commit it again, how will you avoid it the next time? 
Okay, so um, there are a lot of um, loose sentences in an essay. I've, I've checked a lot of um, essays, thousands of papers, and um, sometimes um, the idea is uh, very nice and very clear. However, towards the middle, suddenly it's lost because it's incoherent or there are so many loose sentences or suddenly um, some of the students, they commit a lot of ambiguity which they don't know that they have already committed. And that's the reason why um, I uh, try to really uh, discuss this in the book together with a lot of examples and exercises so that um, the, the students can arrive at this, um, at this realization okay, regarding their mistakes. So um, in the latter portion also, um, we discuss um, some legal stylistics okay i believe that um our book selling point is also in this portion the legal stylistics because it's unique um i i strongly urge you to uh, read the section of this book if it is uh, something that you can uh, relate to especially when you are writing already uh, and um, especially if you wanted to have that force okay, in all your statements to be persuasive, to be um, argumentative, but in a very um, classy and elegant way. Okay? Um, that's the, 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 those are the discussions under legal stylistics. And I, 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 I'm really proud of this section because it uh, is unique and uh, it's seldom seen in other, other, other books. And uh, the thorough the thorough discussion that I did here is um, something that you can um, practice on, and you can uh, have some follow ups because there are a lot of exercises that you you can uh, you can uh, you can do and you can learn from it a lot. Okay, so the legal stylistics, and that's it for my portion. All right, thank you very much for that very rich presentation, Attorney Justin D. Sukgang, uh, Dr. Lex Michael Giritan, and Ms. Joanna Felisa Go, of course. We are very honored to receive such expert guidance, especially at the time when the study and practice of law have become more challenging. Now, in behalf of Rex Education, allow me to congratulate you on yet another feather in your cap with the release of this book. Congratulations. Now, Forward to learning more from you through your books and lectures, of course. Congratulations again, Attorney Justin Sukgang, Dr. Lex Michael Giritan, and Ms. Joanna Felisa Go. And here's to more years of working together as stewards of legal education. All right, so now we've heard from our authors themselves. Now, to all our viewers, our participants, this is your chance to ask questions to our speakers. All you need to do is type them in our comment section down below. Okay, and we will be waiting for your questions. Guys, this is a great opportunity to ask questions and get direct answers from the book authors themselves. Come on. Okay, so do we have uh, our first question now? We are still waiting. Okay, so I guess we have uh, our first question here. This is addressed to our Director and Chief Innovator at Center for Legal Education Advancement and Reform, Attorney Justin Sapgang. Uh, attorney, the question is, uh, this is the first time that I've heard about it, but what do you exactly mean by multidisciplinary approach? Attorney Justin. Thanks, AE, for that question. Uh, thank, thank you guys again. Uh, thank you, Rex. Uh, before I answer this, let me throw off some other related concepts. So there is what you call as in, intradisciplinary, interdisciplinary, 
transdisciplinary, and of course, multidisciplinary. So many people put law on a pedestal as if it's the end-all and be-all discipline. So that is the intradisciplinary approach, where one works within a single discipline alone, as if it can efficiently solve societal problems on its own. But the law is just a tool. It's, it is just but a means, an instrument to an end. In reality, the law draws and should draw from other disciplines. We are raising our perspective, therefore, about law a notch higher, and that's why when we say multidisciplinary, it refers to an approach about uh, where people coming from different disciplines work together to solve a problem. However, they usually stay within their boundaries. So English, applied linguistics, and then law. There's also what you call as interdisciplinary. It requires the integration and synthesis of knowledge and methods from various disciplines. So as such, it acknowledges that problem solving is more than the sum of all disciplines and that each discipline can affect the research outcome of another. But that is quite high for us right now. So we just chose the most applicable for the most number of people. That's why when we say multidisciplinary approach to legal writing, we bring together law, English, and the communication disciplines with the main subject presented from the perspective of these disciplines. So in fact, we purposely chose this approach after reading many of the many prominent jurists how problematic the written communication skills of lawyers and law students alike. For example, according to retired Justice Arturo Brion, who is now the uh, head of the Chancellor of the Philippine Judicial Academy, he said that many bar examinees, to quote, cannot write passable English. Unquote, which rises to disastrous levels when coupled with the lack of competence in law. The Supreme Court Office of the Bar Confident explicitly stated that incorrect English is a more serious problem than the lack of precise knowledge of law, and it has been the cause of high failure rates in the bar exam. Meanwhile, former Ombudsman Conchita Carpio Morales concluded that bar gra bad grammar rather, of Ombudsman lawyers, as well as their poor writing skills, contribute to the delay in the disposition of pending cases filed against erring government officials and employees. So we believe that this is the best way to address the concern uh, presented or posed by those eminent jurists. We need to go back to and finally recognize that the legal profession and the education system can learn many things from other disciplines. Obviously, legal writing is just but a technical form of English and applied linguistics. So that's really what you call a multidisciplinary approach. And just as a segue, and this is also the reason why pre-law students, those who are uh, planning to go to law school, that and that's uh, that is good for them. This book is good for them because the examples are all law-related. But most of the time, uh, it is also good for the law students. This is precisely designed for the first-year law students. So that's it. That's uh, uh, basically what multidisciplinary approach means. Okay, that's that's really interesting, Attorney uh, Gang. Um, I ju we just have another follow-up question in here um, with regards to the first question. What skills do you think are important to legal writing? Okay, uh, if you look at the content of the book, basically it answered that particular question. Legal writing as well as legal oral advocacy. If you reimagine the course legal writing, you would see that legal the answering legal question is the main reason why we have legal writing. So that's the end. Legal writing is just but a means. So if you look at the book, the topics here, for example, legal reasoning and legal research, all of those things are very important. So if you look at the topics like uh, issue spotting skills, yes, you know where to find the law, you have legal research, but you can't spot issues, then that would be a problem. The answer may be, uh, the law may be correct, it may be the correct restatement of the law, but it doesn't mean that you answered the question. So issue spotting is important. Responding to questions is important. Uh, citation is important. Evaluating sources are important. 
is important rather because all of those will go to the persuasiveness of your answer. Remember a while ago, Ms. Joanna talked about it. So it's not only about writing, dull or boring form of writing, but persuasive writing. And that's why this book really is an end-to-end -end seamless. All the skills are here, not only for the pre-law students, but also for first-year law students, but even for battle-tested lawyers, veteran lawyers. They may avail of uh, the, all the advantages of this book. All right. Uh, that's very insightful, Attorney uh, Justin. Now, we have another question coming from Tom Temprosa. Um, I think anyone can answer this. Can lawyers ever be good writers? Mm. I think uh, Attorney Justin can, can answer that yeah. one. Sir. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm a lawyer. Uh, the, uh, being a good writer is a prerequisite of being a good or if not a great lawyer. If you can't write, remember, uh, the arsenal of uh, uh, the, the main weapons of lawyer are his words, which you can see through his writing or which you can hear or listen to through the way he speaks. So lawyers should be good writers. That's the first one. That is a requirement. Or at the very least, lawyers should know how to write. But when we talk about writing or elegant writing, baka that might be a different case. Persuasive writing, it might be a different case, but at the bare minimum, as what has been emphasized by Justice Brion, dapat naman passable writing. So lawyers should be writers as well. Okay, thank you very much for that, Attorney. So, hey, I think I can add something to that. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Tom was actually referring or maybe asking us if there would still be a chance for these lawyers to become good writers. Well, as an English teacher, I can say definitely everyone has an opportunity for us to improve, especially that writers are already used to writing. So what they just need to do is to really understand on how to write better and how to write effectively. And with that understanding, I know that there will still be a chance for these lawyers right now, practicing lawyers, who really wants to become really good writers. So buy the book, you know, and when you are able to do that, we assure you, well, we can give you that assurance that there will really be an improvement in your writing. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for that inside, uh, Dr. Lex uh, Giritan, no? Um, Dr. Lex Giritan is a special science teacher three in English at Philippine Science High School, Caraga Region Campus. Now, sir, uh, I think the next question is very much uh, your forte. The question goes, what is the contribution of your field in applied linguistics having the book presented in a multidisciplinary approach? Well, this was actually my thought ever since um, I took applied linguistics as a major. I have seen that um, since my dad is a lawyer, I was a lawyer, I mean, he's already um, not here in the world right now, but you know, um, I have been, I've been seeing my dad practicing law since I was a child. And, you know, having people coming here at home, um, talking about affidavits and all, all those legal documents, I have realized that all of these things are actually communications, like forms of um, communication and, you know, applied linguistics is really something that can be used in this um, kind of profession because um, lawyers write affidavits or they rewrite pleadings. And um, these things are actually basis onto the decisions of the court. And if these things are not written correctly, that means to say that there is a possibility that the cases being filed will not be filed at all or will not be accepted or will become void, perhaps. So I see the importance of applied linguistics um, evaluative in a way that all of these documents are studied well and um, presented in a very clear manner so that those lawyers who need help in crafting these documents um, will be given aid. So I think that would be uh, my answer for that question. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Garita. And just a quick follow-up. What skills do you think are important to be developed in writing? Can you give us some tips, please? 
Well, all the tips are actually a lot in the book, no? So you can actually just buy the book. But, you know, uh, what I can talk about here is that uh, the, the very important thing in writing is your strategy in critical thinking in a way that you will be able to know how to arrange your sentences correctly. The, the clauses that is being embedded to the main clauses with, which constitutes uh, the, the, the meaning or the totality the, of meaning um, of what you are writing is really very important. So that's why the skill of identifying the combination process or the process of combining these words together is very important. And that is what I have written in our book. And, and just to okay. add to that, uh, mm -hmm. just to add to that, if you look at the first part, the fir second part of the book, so the first part talks about the framework and the philosophy. The second part immediately talks about uh, issue spotting skills and effectively responding to written prompts those two skills actually form part of legal reasoning. So when Lex said a while ago that it's important for you to have critical, a more that part of legal writing is critical thinking skill, then, and that's the, also the reason why we started precisely with legal reasoning. Because you can write, but if you don't know what to write, if you don't know how to strategize, or if you don't know how to support your claims, then that would be hard as well. So if you look at the flow, legal reasoning, English writing, legal writing, then legal research. It is the entire writing process all rolled into one. After you read the book, regardless of whether you're a pre-law student, you're a law student, you're a veteran lawyer, you'll know the entire process. Okay, thank you for that, uh, attorney. Now, um, another question, I think this is directed to Dr. Giritan. How does it feel to be working with topics in legal context? Well, it's, it's really overwhelming since I am not yet a law student, but I was actually planning to take up law this semester. But um, it feels really good to be working with the thing that my father really loves to do. And, you know, um, I am also an advocate for legal education reform because we always, we, we have this understanding of what will be the loss for if this will not be understood by everyone, right? So um, I, I find it really interesting and, you know, it makes me feel happy to, to be talking about these things, especially that this is what my dad really wants me to do. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Margaritan, and good luck to your journey on becoming a lawyer someday. Okay, now let's hear, I think this question now is uh, addressed to our uh, lecturer at De La Salle University at the Department of English and Applied Linguistics, Ms. Uh, Joanna Felisago. Uh, the question is, can you give reasons on why you think linguistics play a very important role in legal writing? Ma'am? Um, for linguistics, it's re yeah. it really plays a very huge role, especially in legal writing. Um, since most of the presentation of the arguments, um, especially when it comes to the legal memos and facts, they follow the principle of, uh, linguist uh, of linguistics, which is also a principle that we apply in legal writing, which are uh, conciseness, clarity, the five Cs that I... Um, showed a while ago. No? Um, you have to have these principles or these skills while you're trying to be uh, persuasive, you're trying to uh, search for the appropriate words to use. So as for a law student, while applying the legal reasoning and analysis to a certain case digest, okay, okay you already read the case. Um, now, how can you uh, put it in a case brief so that you can remember it and you can uh, easily uh, pinpoint the doctrine, okay? Um, especially when you're reviewing for the bar. So um, that is uh, also, I, I found also uh, an interesting question in the FB Live pertaining to the case digest. Yes, we have a very thorough guide on how you can make your case digest very effective 
okay? And um, uh, it's so sad because some of the law students, they entered law school knowing about, about the case digest on the ver on just the very first day or the first week. Oh, what's a case digest? Okay. And uh, just hearing about digest, uh, they have this misconception of the word. If, uh, if since they are uh, ordinary laymen in, during the first weeks of law school, no? But um, what we have here in the book, uh, um, is uh, a lot of uh, a lot of construction of uh, the proper construction of sentences, uh, the proper uh, how to exhibit cogency, okay, so that you can arrive as, uh, uh, with a persuasive argument. And uh, it is very hard to disregard linguistics, okay, because because linguistics really play uh, a huge role. There's syntax, there's semantics, there's linguistic pragmatics in uh, that you, that can help. Law students, but not only law students, even practicing lawyers, okay? Because um, definitely, um, you, we know you know for a fact that um, English is uh, a, a very challenging language for some practicing lawyers. So they they can uh, this book can aid them, can help them in creating documents with clarity, with a force, with candor. So um, I believe that these three particular fields of linguistics really are um, so important and with so much, so much relevance to the legal writing pedagogy. Okay, thank you for that. Now, you talked about the uh, importance of language and law. Now, how do you bridge language and law in teaching legal writing at DLSU? So I have been teaching legal writing in De La Salle uh, together with attorney Justin. And um, I told you that the part of my part will be the bridging Okay, the most important part to, uh, from linguistics to legal writing. And uh, one of the most, or two of the most effective methods that I, I use in my, um, in my teaching will be the, the metacognitive the, the, or the application approach and of course the metacognitive approach or sometimes I call it a self-discovery approach because it's thinking about thinking, thinking about your mistakes and reflecting on it and uh, guided by the rules, the principles and of course the exercises because many of our law students are visual learners. Okay, um, They have to see it repeatedly so that they can, they can really um, it can be stemmed in their, their brain, can be stored there for a long time in their long-term memory. So um, all of the, most of the students, they can construct sentences. Okay, that's already given. However, how good, how well-written, how forceful are those sentences? So in my approach, I use um, the, 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 the rules, their knowledge of uh, compositional um, um, the, the the ordinary compositional method that they have in their undergraduate levels, I use a, 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 a strategy of compositional semantics and pragmatics. Um, um, and uh, as they go along to the development of the course, they, they are not that aware that they're already doing it. So it's like, tell me I'm doing it without me or telling telling me that I'm already doing it. It's like that. So it's a really it's really a discovery approach, and I find it very very effective, um, especially when I give them law related questions. So being a law student also is a huge advantage on my part to effectively teach um, this portion of legal writing, particularly the application of the linguistics. And uh, talking about the metacognitive session, I enable them to think. So um, why is this like that? Why is this wrong? And how can we better or how can we effectively correct this fossilized mistake that you're having or you con constantly do, okay? And um, I, I believe that it's these approaches are very effective for me eh, in the last three years that I've, te I've been teaching legal writing. Attorney Jasin, you want to supplement that? Well, I think uh, going back to the earlier question, uh, when, when we talk about case stages, kasi, uh, it's more of a function of reasoning skills, eh, yung critical thinking skills. Eh. Legal writing comes after. Kasi, syempre, you need to know how to summarize cases. You write it. But before that, you spot issues. Think of it this way. Kasi whenever I teach, the main problem that I encountered is when I ask students about a case, stud I can easily see that students know the case. So they can blurt out uh, law, legal provisions, legal text. So during the Socratic method or the question and answer, the recitation portion, the, the recit, so to speak, 
So you can see that students know Article 36. Students know about 1156. But the problem is when asking about a case, they will give everything about the case, procedural issues, constitutional issues. But in fact, that particular subject is civil law. So th that's a big problem. It just means that the student failed to spot the issue. And if you can't spot issue, then you can't answer question. You don't know what the question is. You can give a correct answer, but that is not the answer to the question. Ergo, that is still, uh, that is incorrect. Or even if you give a correct answer, but you lack legal writing skills, you lack persuasion, you lack the style, then you can still get some few points. You won't merit the entire, the full points. And that's why when we talk about this multidisciplinary approach, you look at the, all the sequences of the topics, it gives you a, an idea, a framework in your mind, how to approach things. Because legal questions will abound, different, you will encounter different legal questions. But when we talk about legal writing, it's not really about only writing memorandum, legal memorandum. Because when you, let's say, you work for a law firm, Writing a memorandum for your senior or junior partner is legal writing. If you work for the government, let's say Office of the President, writing a memorandum, an executive order for the president is legal writing. When you are writing, when you work for the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeals or a regional trial court, decision writing is legal writing. If you are a law student, answering the midterm exam question, answering the final exam question, that requires legal writing. If you're a bar examinee, if you sit for the bar exam, answer the bar, answering the bar exam question is also legal writing. So please disabuse yourself from that notion. A legal writing is only what? Uh, memorandum or opinion writing or academic writing. Almost all aspects of lawyering will require legal writing. And that's why we're, quite, uh, we're pretty confident that this book will be helpful not only for law students, but also for those who are freshly minted lawyers, but even to those who are battle-tested. I keep I kept on rep repeating battle-tested lawyers. So even the veteran lawyers may uh, benefit from the book. All right, thank you for that uh, input, Attorney Justin. And uh, just to finish things off, uh, we have another follow-up question. You mentioned a while ago, uh, Ma'am Joanna, that you are uh, a senior law student and a lecturer at the same time. Now, how do you cope with uh, juggling those two? And does your work get in your studies? They want to know. Okay. Um, as for me being both, I enjoy both worlds. And it's very rare to be given an opportunity to teach while being in law school. It's really rare. And I am very thankful for this opportunity. I'm thankful for my deal department, my Department of Applied Linguistics and uh, department, especially Dr. Rochelle Lucas for granting me the opportunity for our Dean, then Dean Raymond Season, and also for Attorney Justin and Dean Hill of the College of Law for also uh, selecting me among um, their lecturers to be granted this opportunity to teach. And uh, um, it is really hard to be both senior law student and um, a lecturer at the same time. In fact, before this, I, I just finished my Revalida um, in, from a law class. So it was, uh, it's really hard. Um, it's just a matter of prioritizing which one should be uh, should you focus first before you uh, proceed on to another. And of course, a lot of time management because um, whenever I have extra time, um, I, I usually will take a lot of rest. I, I sleep uh, because um, you have to sleep so that you can understand the digest. Otherwise, you'll be very sleepy. You'll have to repeat it or reread it again and again. So the case, so, the, so it's very time consuming. Also, um, what else? I also, uh, whenever there's a free cut, I try to uh, read ahead um, and also practice um, answering bar exam questions each day, at least three, at least five bar questions each day so that I won't be surprised um, <laughs> during the bar examinations for next year. Okay, um, So these are my preparations. And of course, definitely, I always pray. 
prayer is very helpful in at all times. I always pray. Um, I I maintained my faith. It is my source, my my source of inspiration, my source of motivation, alongside all good instructors that that I have. Um, some may be very difficult to pass. Others are really, really um, uh, very, uh, how do you call that? Uh, f- they're very persuasive in making you become uh, a, a good law student and to pa- eventually pass the bar also. So law school is also harsh. So I have my uh, classmates to help me for that. So you have to select your own your own uh, your your group also in law school so that they can help you and um, I'm lucky because there are a lot of reliable people that I can count to who I can count to um, although I don't belong to a certain peer but I, I am very lucky to have these people have my back in numerous occasions so that's all especially in my coping as for the lecturing, um, I try. LaSalle gives us uh, a lot of opportunities to have to uh, um, apply all our strategies in teaching, be it synchronous or asynchronous. So um, I'm also blessed to have such an institution be very supportive of the lecturers. A- sorry, AA. A- I just want to mention to everyone that Miss Joanna is. I uh, know she just got off from her revalida. So, kanina, before this book launch, kaka-revalida niya lang. So, kita niyo really how she juggles the ano, uh, teaching, learning, and even writing books. All right. Wow. Congratulations, um, Joanna, Miss Joanna Felisago. And let's uh, all learn from that, okay? So, we have to really manage our time. Take you know, enough sleep if you can, and always pray. Now, we have more questions coming in. We have one from Patricia and Jose. Um, it says, good afternoon. I'd like to ask the authors how legal writing is different from writing that students would learn in undergraduate studies. Okay. Perhaps I can answer that and Miss Joanna can uh, supplement my answer. Well, I mentioned a while ago that legal writing is just but the technical form of English writing. So the problem is when law students put premium, uh, when people or even lawyers put premium on, okay, this is the law. This is, it's placed on the highest pedestal. We lose focus on the things that are, for example, uh, legal writing that are actually important in that particular aspect of the law. So, for example, in education, one of my advocacies is really about legal education reform. Education is about teaching. If you only think about law, as in it's the, you put it, place it on the pedestal, you lose focus on other techniques, other strategies from disciplines that you can pick and apply to law teaching. And the same can be said with legal writing. So, legal writing really is just but technical writing. The context is law. The subject is law. But if you write English in English writing in that subject, then you can also see persuasiveness. It's a requirement. Cogency is a requirement. Correctness, the accuracy in writing, all of those skills are very important. Okay? Uh, do you want to add something, Ms. Joanna? Yes, um, to supplement that also. Um, there's also what you call the a, a fundamental step um, in, in, the, in the field of legal writing. And it's um, a bit higher in level, especially when you're writing or analyzing case digest, um, the objective analysis. So here you have to be very thoughtful and very deliberate about your sentence construction um, because it will help you determine uh, what is the focus of my sentence, uh, especially when you're drafting a legal document. And it will help also um, give a supplementary discussion on certain on certain uh, comprehensible inputs that you wanted to have or the, the relevant facts or issues in a case, particularly um, towards the doctrine or the ruling. So the, the, the thing that makes um, legal writing different from the undergraduate writing or the college writing are what uh, attorney Justin said a while ago. And uh, of course, 
setting the persuasive tone in a higher level. Um, and um, of course, being persuasive does not really mean that you have to overemphasize on everything, like you're, you're giving a lot of flowery words. Of course, um, definitely, you have to maintain that subtle tone, but still maintain to, uh, the persuasiveness. And that is, um, th those are the discussions, the unique discussions that you won't see in other books. And you will, uh, you will see it uh, in the core of our, uh, of our book. So grab one, okay? Because you will definitely have a lot of realizations, okay, regarding um, your initial style in maybe creating some paragraphs or creating or, or writing your essays, okay? It will really uh, help you improve in your writing. Okay, so thank you for uh, your input, Attorney Justin Sokgang and um, Ma'am Joanna. Uh, I think the next question is very much related to uh, legal writing, okay? Because uh, Robert Cruz asked, is there really a need to use legalese in legal writing? Okay, so the jargons, is that really necessary for us to use? Mm -hmm. So anyone can answer. Uh, I'll go first. Okay. I, I, I don't want to say with certainty that you need to remove all those Harry Potter-like verb <laughs> sentences you, you learn from StatCon or even from other courses. Mm -hmm. Because remember, legal writing is a technical form of writing. Okay. So it's technical form of writing. It depends on a particular, the particular need of the course, the particular need of, uh, of the question that you are trying to address. So if it is required, if you feel that it's required to blurt out some of those uh, Duralex Sedlex, then by all means do so. But most, more often than not, actually, and Miss Joanna can answer this, you don't need it, actually. Usually, you don't need it. But sometimes, to add flavor, to add persuasiveness, you need to. And especially, in light of a particular question that you need to address. So we don't want to say avoid legalese, avoid, act, uh, avoid passive voice. It really depends. And that's why we start with legal reasoning and then English writing, and then legal writing, and then end with legal research and citations, and academic writing, actually. Well, I think I can also add something to that. Um, while writing the book, I was also exposed uh, to um, uh, researching about these things, about the language, about legal language. And um, legal language actually really has a certain or a distinct feature, and that is actually um, influenced by those, um, you know, the, the history of the legal language, which um, also involves like the use of Latin words, the use of French words, and all of those things. Those are actually also discussed in the book. I mean, in our um, introductory statements. And um, the point of the book, the reason why we have written this book was actually for legal education reform. And part of that is actually not really trying to get away Mm -hmm. or to get rid of it totally, but we know that there is a certain feature of this legal language that uses that. We can still use that, I would say. Uh, lawyers can still use that, but the advocacy that we have here is that we just really need to write clearly with all those principles in legal writing. Because, you know, um, the language, the legal language used like centuries ago, was actually designed not to uh, for for other people not to understand the language, and that is not what we want to do now. We want everyone to understand what we are writing, even if they are not law practitioners. Let's say your clients, your lawyer, and you have a client. Of course, the important thing that you need to do is to let your client understand what you are doing. And that is the purpose of the book also, so that the law, understanding the law, will not just be for law practitioners, but for everyone who needs to understand it. For everyone. I mean, the reason why there is a law is because of the community. And, um, you know, having the community being able to understand what the lawyers are writing, that is um, what we think is the very important thing. 
That's why um, we have written this book. All right, thank you for that um, input, Dr. Lex Giritan. And yes, you're correct. Our goal in communication is first to express and not to impress. So let's take note of that. Now we have another question here. Um, it says, one of the problems being a law student is the case digest. How will the book, Legal Writing, help law students in drafting case digest? Okay, I think I can best answer that, no? <laughs> Especially that I normally will apply all the strategies in linguistics in my case digest. Um, my case digest uh, should be really just uh, substantial and short and concise. Okay, uh, I can see that other other law students they will copy the entire facts of the case and everything. It's the process of elimination which one is important and which one is not. In our book, um, we have we in especially in the field of linguist legal style in the in the portion of legal stylistics, um, I discuss there how you will um, you you should consider this word. Will you consider it in this position or not? Uh, besides that, there are other strategies like um, the nominalizations. Um, are you going to totally omit the nominalizations or are you going to retain it in some way? A while ago, there is a, a mention of the legal uh, maxims or the, le the Latin maxims or the legal jargons being, uh, um, you know, particularly uh, very, um, how do you call that? It's uh, retaining the, the, the use of, um, some jargons or some 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 statements. Uh, actually, it really helps, especially um, like res judicata, right? It's it, you don't when when we transfer it or when we uh, when we translate it in our normal English, it will be very wordy. But in just two words, you already you already hit the bullet. Um, in those occasions, the proper word choosing, uh, the legal stylistics, um, the nominalization discussions in the book. This will really help you and enable you to produce a more functional, pragmatic case brief. Or yeah, okay, a case brief because um the the practice for so many years have been um a little erroneous, um especially when you look at it uh, or Google it. Okay, it's not the case brief that you wanted to have, especially if you are already in fourth year because you won't remember everything there. So definitely. Um, uh, try our book, uh, try the exercises here and apply it when you're making your case briefs so that, or your, your case digest so that uh, you can really know uh, which, which are substantial and which, one are, which ones are irrelevant. All right, thank you so much for that, um, Ms. Joanna Felisago. And um, for our last question, I'm sure uh, everyone is eager to ask more questions, but uh, this is our last question for now. What are the similarities and differences or connection of legal writing in writing a research? This question comes from Jeanette Ubat. Anyone can answer. Perhaps I'll answer that and then Lex can add to it. So we wrote, uh, co-wrote the chapter on the academic form, thesis writing. Okay. Again, when we talk about legal question, the legal question may come in different forms. A memorandum, uh, the president asking you what executive order he wants you to write, your partner asking you how to resolve the case, the judge asking you, if, or the justice asking you how should we resolve the case, those are legal questions. So legal writing is important because uh, the forms, the, all those forms of questions will necessarily require the skills important to legal writing. Part of those questions, or one of the forms of those questions, is in the form of academic writing. If you write a law journal article, it is the same process. It's almost you use the almost the same process as if you're writing a memorandum for the president or the executive secretary or for your partner. The same. But one of the innovations in this book is that we dissected the different, the usual parts of academic writing. So we noticed in the market, uh, it's quite, there is uh, some sort of deficiency in when it comes to mater reference materials delving into academic legal writing. And that's why we added a portion on that. So the parts of thesis writing, 
the different uh, research methodologies that you may use. So those are under the for our chapter on legal research. But but again, do not lose sight that re academic writing will always require all the skills for legal writing. The form may be different, the template may be different, the number of pages may be different, but skills, the skills will not be different. You use the same skills. Iba lang yung itsura. Yes, I would yes, I would agree with the authorities of Gang. Well, um, actually, just mentioned about the skill, and this is very important. Like um a, thor, um, a very good friend, um Commissioner Attorney um Jose T. Sorara T actually mentioned that lawyers really do legal research every day. All right. And with that statement, I was actually thinking, since I am not a lawyer and I'm not yet in the law school, I was actually thinking about two terms. Legal research, when you mean um, researching like precedents of cases, precedent uh, cases, um, in a way that you are able to answer or to rebut something, um, you know, what lawyers really do every day. So, you know, they, they need to research like, um, old cases so that they, it can be a reference to their new case um, that is legal research that is already researching and uh, identifying issues is actually a skill that can actually help you out also in doing that kind of research. Now the second research that I want to talk about is the academic writing uh, the legal research writing wherein um, uh, student lawyers can actually be uh, contributors to law journals and what we did in the book was really discuss the kinds of legal research that lawyers should do and ako, as, as majoring in applied linguistics and a researcher myself I haven't really seen a lot of law journals coming from Filipino students and I think we need to reinforce that one and encourage everyone to write something about that and contribute to the pool of knowledge in the field of law. Because there are a lot of things that are still yet to be discovered on how these court decisions are done, on how lawyers interpret um, other cases, other old cases, and how they actually bring it about in a new context and how they use it as a rebuttal to their um, to their arguments. And those are just very important things. And, you know, the parts of the thesis paper or a research paper are also briefly discussed at the last chapter of our book, wherein students will have a grasp of what a qualitative research is, of what a quantitative research is, and how they're going to start writing their thesis. And that is something that we have not found in most books in legal writing. So you see, um, our book is actually not just about the plain legal writing. It's also developing your skills in doing research for both the practice of law and at the same time, your contribution as a lawyer or a law practitioner in, in research articles. Uh, AA, perhaps just to uh, put the uh, push the point further, when we, we said that uh, the book is seamless, that the book is holistic, we really meant it. And that's why when you grab the book, in the end, you will know everything, almost every skill. Well, again, it is a shared commitment. So we give the content. I hope you really read the book well and you study the material well. But if you go over the book, the entire writing process would be there. It would appear. Because towards the end, before you delve into academic writing, we also put a chapter. We had a heavy discussion on citation. We weren't partial about, let's say, uh, only the Maroon Manual or the Ateneo Journal Manual or the Blue Book in the Harvard Blue Book System in the United States. We presented everything. In fact, if you look at different research, even legal research books, those, that particular aspect is missing, but you can find that in the book. We were heavy in citation, heavy in plagiarism, and 
I'm not saying that we plagiarize. No, we were heavy on the discussion about plagiarism, to be more accurate, so that you would know the entire learning, uh, the entire writing process. And that is why, if you are a law professor right now, teaching legal writing, so you can communicate with us, so we can give uh, uh, give lectures to you on how to use the book. So feel feel free to reach us, and perhaps I can answer one of your questions uh, through Facebook Live. So don't hesitate to reach us so we can share to you how the book can help you teach legal writing. Also, um, AA, I know that there was a question about um, is our book actually grounded with what uh, the style of the ombudsman, like the ombudsman style? And yes, definitely. We have actually referred to what is being practiced in the Philippines right now. Actually, not just in the Philippines, but, but um, you know, internationally. Um, um, these books were actually uh, used also as a reference in, in writing our book right now. Uh, so there's no need for there's no need a need for for these um, people to worry about that because of course we are not going to write something that will not be in accordance to what is being asked by the Supreme Court or by the ombudsman themselves. All right, thank you so much for that. Um... Uh, Dr. Lex Giritan, Dr. Attorney Justin Supgang, and Ms. Joanna Felisa Gross. I'm sure um, you, our uh, audience, our participants, still has a lot of questions in mind. But as Attorney Supgang said a while ago, you can just uh, purchase the book and probably, you know, direct message the authors so they can answer further more questions. So thank you so much for sharing your insights about the, uh, the book, our guest speakers. Now, at this point, let us listen to someone to tell us more about what makes the book an expert guide and resource in the study of law. Um, everyone, let us give a warm virtual welcome to Mr. Henry Villamiel, a student at the De La Salle University. Hello. Hi, sir. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for having me here. My name is Henry Villamiel. I'm an incoming sophomore in De La Salle College of Law. So when I was told that um, there will be a book that will encapsulate our entire legal writing course, I got very excited and I told myself that I really have to get my hands on a copy of the book immediately. You see, um, in, in a normal day, um, legal writing would plainly talk about how to write pleadings, memoranda, and all that. Um, but in our legal writing course, together with uh, Attorney Justin Sokgang and Ms. Uh, Joanna Go, um, we experienced a lot more than that. We, I appreciated how um, we were um, reviewed of the basics of grammar. We were, in fact, asked to um, answer a diagnostic exam of some sort uh, for us to assess ourselves um, how uh, where we are in, in these things. Because, of course, as um, graduate students, we would always think that we don't need to be reminded of these things. But little did we know as students that these things are actually essential for us. So not only did we um, uh, discuss basic grammar rules, we also got acquainted with proper outlining and other things such as avoiding plagiarism and um, evaluating sources and also proper citation. So in class, what I really liked about um, what what I really liked about our sessions was that um, we were reminded of the importance of outlining, which in fact I honestly do until today. So I'm really grateful that um, this method is um, encapsulated in the book uh, because I really can't wait um, to get my hands. On a copy. One more very important thing that is um, in this book, which is likewise discussed during our classes, was that uh, the importance of citation and the different systems of citation. So in the legal profession, one would um, have first impressions of us usually just um, arguing or articulating before the court or before any, um, any venue. But then we were acquainted and we were made um, to realize that Legal, the legal practice and also being a legal student is way more than that. It actually involves a lot of writing, which is why um, this subject is very crucial. And to know that every lesson that we had before um, 
is in one material already and like everything is already consolidated it's a big relief you know i wish i could um go through the entire um legal writing course again with this book because i am very sure that um i will have a very easy time in terms of um grasping all the lessons and the important things that um that our um esteemed authors have prepared for us so i i always um I'm one of those students who will always imagine about the future and the future for me is also taking up further studies after law school. And um, with, with this book, I think I'll bring this book with me when I pursue my LLM. Um, and I am very excited because I know that actually not only for LLM, but even during practice that this material will be very useful. So I am so happy that we now have this book with us and every um every detail on grammar on citation on legal writing is already summarized and well outlined because this can be a material used by not only students law students but also lawyers in practice so thank you very much um uh, to the authors for um making this i am so honored to speak on behalf of the students who are likewise very excited to go through their first year um, or um, any other subject with this book handy. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Henry William Mill, for uh, gracing this book launch. We hope the best for you and good luck to your studies. Okay, so um, now we are very, very much honored to be joined by other by another legal expert who can best guide us to use the book for a better legal writing. Okay, so now let us give a warm virtual welcome to Commissioner Zenaida Elepano, the officer in charge of the Legal Education Board. Good afternoon, everyone. My former colleague and a very good friend of mine at the Legal Education Board, Attorney Justin Sokgang, appears to have placed me in double jeopardy. First, several weeks ago, he asked me to write a foreword for this book on legal writing that he and two of his friends English language experts Lex Michael Giritan and Joanna Go co-authored. Then Justin asked me again, this time to deliver a testimonial at today's book launching. Tall orders, it may seem, punitive even in a manner of speaking, for one as ancient as I, who should be enjoying her rare free times from work at the Legal Education Board. By all accounts, I should forgive Justin for this imposition. The truth, however, is that I am delighted with and thankful for the opportunity that Justin has given me to express my thoughts and concerns about the state of the art of legal writing in our country today. Professor Richard Wydick, a renowned legal writing expert and author of his book, Plain English for Lawyers, has this to say, and I quote, we lawyers do not write plain English. We use eight words to say what could be said in just two. We use arcane words to express commonplace ideas. Seeking to become precise, we become redundant. Seeking to be cautious, we become verbose. Our sentences twist on phrase within clause, within clause, that glaze the eyes and numb the minds of our readers. The result is a writing style 
that has four outstanding characteristics, wordy, unclear, pompous, and dull. End of quote. How succinctly expressed is this observation? This is perhaps why legal writing has always been generally considered to be notoriously bad. Lawyers generally sometimes think that the legal profession gives them the license to use lawyerisms, uh, sometimes called law speak, excessively. Words that to the layman sound impressive but which carry no substance or content at all. Words such as the Latin terms ipso facto, pro tanto, ad cautela, or the overused and overworked English words herein before, herein after, heretofore, wherefore, aforesaid, said. But words, no doubt, are the most important tool of the law profession. The lawyer spends his professional life using words to communicate to others what he knows and to persuade them that what he has said or written is right. A lawyer, therefore, who cannot communicate effectively might as well take off the shingle from his law office and pursue a career that does not involve communication at all. Or better yet, as my law professor at UST admonished us, his students, more than half a century ago, for us to go home and just plant kamote. The urgent need of the legal profession to speak and write well is highlighted by the state of legal writing in our country today. Let me give you examples. I was bar examiner three times in 1996 for remedial law, in 2006 for legal ethics, and in 2009 for civil law. But it was in the bar examinations of 2006 in legal ethics, however, that I found the best examples of severe disabilities in legal writing and the answers of a lot of bar candidates, the answers of which I recorded for the sake of posterity and for illustrative purposes in my classes on legal writing and lectures for Philja and MCLE seminars. These are the examples that I'd like to share with you. On legal forms, one of the questions asked uh, in the examinations is to draft an information for arson. A bar candidate wrote, and I quote, I was burned the house of Juana de la Cruz at Quiapo, Manila, exactly 12.30 midnight. I supposed to burn only the kitchen, but because of the lighting, it will be burned whole, the house of Juana. I will use the gasoline for the burning house. Another example, in a case for acts of lasciviousness, a bar examinee drafting an, an affidavit of desistance wrote as follows, quote, that I was pressured by my family to execute this affidavit of distance. Wherefore, I am executing this voluntarily without fear of evasion. So help me God. Close quote. Another example. 
formulating an affidavit of self-adjudication of interstate estate, a bar examinee apparently had ambitions of divinity because he wrote as an answer to the question, and I quote, Know all men by this premises, that I am the only begotten Son of the Father, unquote. Another wrote, I, the deceased person, hereby reposed, adjudicate my property to my surviving wife and children. We all laugh, but we also shudder in the realization that this is how potential lawyers, potential prosecutors, and even potential judges may write. And yet, there are still people around who want the bar examinations to be abolished. A survey of the best writings in the legal profession will reveal that indicators that make for lucid, well-reasoned, forceful pieces of writing are the following, as identified by Professor Weyhofen, accuracy, brevity, and clarity. Some call it the ABC of legal writing. But it is in the legal profession where these qualities are difficult to cultivate and develop. For the lawyer is always torn between the need to be precise, brief, and factual on one hand, and the urge to give vent to his or her actual or imagined poetic or literary skills on the other. If a lawyer or a judge is not careful, he or she may end up writing a legal document that is as terse, dry, and boring as an accountant's list, or may produce a paper that is short on law and facts, but long on rhetoric and fiction. So what constitutes good legal writing? The book on legal writing by Sukgang, Giritan, and Go answers this question. It provides excellent insights and instructions on style and technique of legal writing. And it helps us, lawyers and students of law, to write well in good English, correct grammar, syntax, and good sentence structure using the Aristotelian three approaches to good communication, credibility or ethos, an appeal to the heart or pathos, and an appeal to the mind or logos. To my mind, this book is more comprehensive and instructive than Professor Richard Weidick's bestseller of a book which I mentioned earlier, Plain English for Lawyers, in the sense that Weidick was writing for lawyers whose native language is English and therefore do not need much education in the whys and wherefores of the English language. In contrast, the grand, eloquent, and flamboyant writing uh, style and technique of the old that has been carried over through the centuries, through the years, to today, and has permeated legal writing in these modern times. The book reconstructs the legal writing method into one in which language is simple, the message clear, and the composition brief. Indeed, a boon to legal writing. Uh, practitioners, as well as learners, 
even. At this point, I would like to ask you to give a shout out to its authors for their excellent opus, a multidisciplinary approach to legal writing. Mabuhay, Justin, Lex, Michael, and Joanna. Thank you and good day. Okay, so thank you very much for all these kind words, Commissioner Elepano and also Mr. Okay, so Villamel. Hearing your praises of the book gives us utmost pride for having been chosen and entrusted with the publication of this masterpiece. In the same vein, allow us to express our gratitude to you as well for being stewards of legal education and law practice yourselves. Okay, so I think uh, this is the best time for us to uh, hear some parting messages from our book authors, starting with Attorney Justin Sukdan. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you again, Rex, for giving us this opportunity to publish the book. I think uh, if you are really uh, interested and are it is passionate about improving your skill in legal writing, but not only that, improving your critical thinking skills, and not only that, improving your research skills, then I believe that the book is something that you really need right now. The book is designed, again, not only for those students, although primarily that is, or those are the persons, the audience, who are in our mind when we were writing the book. But if you look at the book, you look at the features of the book, you look at the value added of the book, it will definitely help not only first-year law students, but even those who are planning to take up law, those who are already in the practice, regardless whether in first three, five years of your practice, but also even, hopefully, for those who are veteran lawyers, or those who are members of the bench and also of the bar. So thank you for giving, us, for giving us this opportunity, Rex, and I hope people will see the value, the merit of the book, and will have the chance to buy the book. Um, okay, for me? Let's have Dr. Lex Giritan, yeah. Yeah, first of all, again, I'd like to thank Rex for, for this opportunity to publish our book. And um, my message goes to those people who are actually doubting themselves. Now, if you're a person who is really doubting yourself in your skill in writing, don't frown because we have already done the thing for you. So we have prepared this book for you to use. And since we are very young, <laughs> well, we are young, me, Justin, and Miss Joanna, of course, we know what you really need. And we have outlined that one in our book so that you don't really have to worry about writing anymore. So again, to all the lawyers, practicing lawyers, student lawyers, even those people who are um, into writing, legal writing, or um, you know, spotting issues in readings, this book is for you. So. This is actually not just to, to you know, ask you to buy the book, but we know that this is really helpful for every one of you. So it's up to you guys. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Garita. Now let's have Miss Joanna Felisa go. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was using the other audio. Uh, so maybe a spotlight on will uh, help. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, um, we are uh, three different people, um, but we are united in our advocacy to really enhance the instruction and the strategies um, in legal writing in a clear manner to the book. Please support and uh, we also, um, you, you will not be disappointed with the contents of the book because um, you can compare it um, with any, any other book in the market. It's really innovative. It uh, presents um, the novelist of ideas and the novelist of strategies. And uh, we can really guarantee that 
it can help you um, towards your um, your 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 learnings, especially in enhancing and honing your writing skills. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Miss Joanna Felisa Go. Okay, now for our viewers, our attendees for this afternoon, as promised, we will now be giving away a copy of uh, this new book. All right, so we will be drawing six lucky winners. Okay, to win the book entitled A Multidisciplinary Approach to Legal Writing by, of course, our beloved Rex authors, Attorney Justin uh, Sokgang, Dr. Lex Michael Giritan, and Miss Joanna Felisa Go. And of course, we are also giving away uh, 500 pesos to four lucky winners. Okay, so we have our uh, wheel there. So reminder... We will be announcing the names of this uh, of the lucky winners for this raffle. Now, if your name is called, don't forget to comment down present. All right, so we know that you're still here with us. Now, in case that you are able to comment present within 30 seconds, unfortunately, we will be drawing another winner from our list of registrants. So, let's now spin the wheel. And let's see who is going to be our first winner. All right, all right. Let's see who is the first winner of our um, of our new book. Come on. So guys, bantayan, okay? Baka name nyo na yung mapili dito. And please don't forget to comment present. Okay? We will give you 30 seconds only to comment present in the chat chat box. Okay. So do we have our first winner? Okay, our first winner is Cristeta J Lapitan. So Cristeta, can you uh, type present in the chat box? Okay, so 30 seconds starts now. Okay, Chris Teta, are you still with us? So far, we have 158 live participants. Okay, Chris Teta, okay, I see you commenting. So we have Chris Teta J. Lapitan as our first winner. Congratulations. So please note that Chris Teta Lapitan is our first winner. Okay, so time's up, I guess. All right, so... Let's do another raffle, okay? So this time, we still have five more lucky winners to win the new book. Okay, so let's spin that wheel. Okay, so again... If your name gets picked or if you see your name flashed on screen, don't forget to type present in the comment section down below. Okay, who is going to be our lucky winner? Let's see. Ken Espino. All right. Ken, are you here? Can you type present in our chat box? You have 30 seconds to do so. Okay, Ken, is Ken still here? Ken Espino? Yeah. Okay, how many seconds left? Let's see. Mm hmm Okay, so I think Ken Espino is not here with us anymore. Maybe he logged out early. So, are we gonna draw another name? Okay. Yes, we are going to draw another name. So, stay tuned. Stay glued to your uh, computer screen. Okay, so let's do this. Who is our second lucky winner?
Let's see. All right, so we have Michael Vincent Puy. Michael Vincent Puy, are you here? Are you present in our um, Facebook Live raffle? Please comment present in the chat box. Okay, so Michael Vincent Uy is present. Congratulations. You are our second lucky winner of the Nobu, a multidisciplinary approach to legal writing. Okay, so let's draw the third winner. You spin the wheel now. Okay. So our next winner is Matt Sepe. All right, Matt Sepe. Please, if you are here, comment present in the chat box. You have 30 seconds. All right, where is Matt Sepe? Are you here, Matt? Is Matt Sepe present? Let's see, let's see. Okay. Matt Sepe. We want to see you type present in the chat box. Come on. Okay. Okay, so Matt Sepe is present. Congratulations, Matt. You won. Um, you won a copy of the book, A Multidisciplinary Approach to Legal Writing. Okay, congratulations to you. Now, let's, uh, let's do another uh, spin. Who is going to be our fourth lucky winner? All right. The, name, the, the winner's name is Russell Jan. Russell Jan, can you please type present in our chat box? If you're present. Uh -huh. Okay, where is Russell Jan? You hear Russell? Let's see. Okay, few seconds left. Oh, I think Russell is not here, so I think he can be uh, drawing another winner for this one. So we still have three more books to give away. Okay, so can we spin the wheel again, please? Okay, so our winner is Lyndon Faith Lantaco. Lyndon Faith Lantaco the second. Okay, is Lyndon Faith a male or a female? Lyndon Faith, are you here? Can you comment present in our comment section, please? Lyndon, are you here? Come on, don't miss this chance. Let's see. Okay, so Linden Lantaco is present. Okay, so congratulations. You also win the, uh, the new book. Okay, so we will be drawing two. Okay, two more for this book. So can we spin the wheel again, please? Right. 
So while we are waiting for the next winner, just make sure that you comment present in the chat box. Okay, so we have Marian Nokom. Okay, Marian Nokom. Please comment present in the chat box. And sorry, we missed the name. Okay, so apparently Matt Sepe is present. So um, congratulations, Matt. You will also be receiving a copy of the new book. Okay, don't be sad anymore. So we saw your name. Okay, so a multidisciplinary approach to legal writing book for you as well. Congratulations. Okay, so Marian Nokom is also present. So congratulations. So that brings us to one last raffle winner. Okay, who will this be? Let's see. Can we spin the wheel again, please, for our last winner? Okay, so the last winner is Gwen Micaela Domingo. Gwen Micaela Domingo can comment present in our chat box. Okay, so I see your name now. So we have Gwen Micaela Domingo. So she is present. Now, congratulations to all our six lucky book winners. Now, we are drawing four lucky winners of 500 pesos. Okay. So same same rule, okay? So once your name gets picked, you have to comment down present in our comment section. All right. So let's pin the wheel for the first 500 peso winner. Okay, so our first 500 peso winner is Akisha Ku. Alright, Akisha Ku, you are the first lucky winner of 500 pesos. Can you type present in the chat box, please, if you are here? Are you here, Akisha Ku? Okay, where is Akisha Ku? 30 seconds. Are you there? Time's up. Okay, I think Akisha Ku is, um, is present or is she is she present or not? Okay, so Akisha Ku is not here anymore with us, unfortunately. So we have to draw uh, a new winner of 500 pesos. Okay, so let's spin the wheel. All right. So we have Tony Paul Estudio Fortaleza. Joni Paul, Fortaleza, if you're here, comment present in our chat box. You have 30 seconds to do that. Okay, congratulations. Um, Joni Paul is actually present. All right, so we are drawing three more winners of 500 pesos. So let's spin the wheel again. Okay, who can this be? I'm excited to know. Okay, so our next winner is Shane Rastelis. Shane Rastelis, if you are present, please comment down below. Okay, where is Shane Rastelis? You have 30 seconds. Okay, congratulations, Shane. She commented present, so she is going to be our second winner of 500 pesos. Now, can we spin the wheel again for our third 500 peso winner? 
Let's see who will this be. Valencia. Willy Valencia, you are our third 500 peso cash winner. So we have 30 seconds to comment present in our chat box. Are you here? Willy? So, okay. You have 15 seconds left. Okay, 10 seconds to go. All right, is Willy Valencia present? So time's up. Do we have any confirmation if Willy Valencia is present? Okay, so Unfortunately, we have to draw another one because Willie is not around. Okay, so kindly spin the wheel again for our third winner. Okay, so the next winner is Fulgocino Lucas Manilin. Or Manilin Fulgocino, I suppose. Are you here, Manilin? Can you please uh, type present in the chat box if you are still here with us? Okay, Manilin, are you still here? Can you please type present? You have 30 seconds to do so. Okay, we are just waiting for the confirmation. If Manilin is present. Let's see. Okay, so time's up. Is Manilin Fulgocino present? Can we confirm, please? Okay, sorry, but Manilin Fulgocino is not around, so we will be drawing another one. All right, kindly spin the wheel now. Again, you have to comment within 30 seconds because if you uh, commented late, then we will not be accepting your comment anymore. It's a good chance to others, I suppose. Okay, we have Carlo Miguel Sambua our third winner of the 500 pesos. Are you here, Michael or Miguel? Okay, let's see, let's see. Okay, please comment down present if you are here. Okay, so we have Carlo Sambua. Congratulations. Carlo is present. Okay. So let's do the last raffle. Okay. The last winner of the 500 pesos. Okay, so our last winner is Feliz Lucenjoy. Okay, Feliz. Feliz Lucenjoy. Okay, so kindly uh, comment present if you are here. You have 30 seconds. All right, so again, for all those who uh, are commenting late, um, we won't be honoring the comment because as stated in the rules it has to be uh within 30 seconds okay so i hope that's clear all right so congratulations to felice tukin hoy she's present again congratulations to all our raffle winners the 10 lucky raffle winners for uh this afternoon's event on that note 
We have come to the end of this afternoon's program. Indeed, it was a very productive uh, learning afternoon with our luminaries, Attorney Justin Sukdang, Dr. Lex Michael Giritan, and Ms. Joanna Felisa Go, and of course, our distinguished guests. On behalf of Rex Education, I would like to express our heartfelt gratitude for having been chosen as your partner in legal education. We look forward to more years of fruitful partnership as we continue to work together to enable law students and lawyers achieve their dreams of becoming lawyers and excelling as one. All right. Now to everyone who joined us this afternoon, thank you for learning with us and for choosing Rex Education to be your partner in learning. See you all on our next book launch and lecture. Thank you and keep soaring, Educampions. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, AA. Congrats, Potterny, Dr. Lex, and Mr.